Thanks. As all of you know, DART stands for Deeply Obscure Theorems. <laughs> Whereas what you would like to have is a simple calculus for a language that we can understand. <laughs> and in this talk, I'll present a type safety proof for the DART calculus that formalizes Scala. And this type safety proof is simple. But before we look into this, let's understand what's so special about Scala that we need a, you know, its own, that it needs its own calculus. So you plot 50 types of aquarium fish, and you need to assign these fish to different aquariums so that they get along and don't eat each other. And you can solve this problem in Scala. So the way you can do this is you can define a special type for aquariums, and inside of it you can have a special type for fish, and a field fish list where you can actually store your aquarium fish. So with this, you can define a special aquarium for goldfish where the type fish is equal to goldfish and a special type for piranha aquariums where type fish is equal to piranha. And now you can find an add fish method that takes an aquarium and a fish and creates a new aquarium with an extended fish list. And the interesting thing here is that you can specify at the type level that the type of fish that you add to the aquarium should be the same type of the fish in the existing aquarium. Okay, so now if you have a goldfish, then you can take a goldfish aquarium and add a goldfish to it, and you will get a goldfish aquarium back. But if you take a piranha aquarium and you add a goldfish to it, you will get a type error. And the reason that you can do this in Scala is that we have abstract type members that allow us to define types that are specific to runtime objects and path-dependent types that allow us to refer to these types. So you can see that, oh, and so more generally, a path-dependent type is a type that depends on the runtime value of the path to an object. So you can see that this is really a step towards fully dependent types, and in fact, a calculus that encompasses these ideas in a type-safe way appeared only in the last couple of years, and um, this calculus is called DOT, and it stands for Dependent Object Types. So the proof that I'll present in this paper is a version um, that was, is a ver for a version of DOT that was presented at last year's Swadler Fest by Nada Amin and others. And, um, but I will show later that you can extend the same ideas to other versions of DOT. So one powerful feature that DOT enables is it allows you to define custom subtyping relationships within Scala. And with this, you can create new, sub, uh, new type systems within the language. For example, Scala and Yoshida use this feature to define session types inside of Scala. And I want to show you how to define custom subtyping inside of DOT. So what you can do is you can create a, a function with the following parameter type. And I will show below the, the corresponding code in Scala. So the first component of the type is the de type declaration. And what it says is that you have a type member A, and you can specify lower and upper bounds for this type. So in this case, the lower type is bottom, and the, upper, the, the, the up, upper bound is top. So A, this means that A is some type between bottom and top. Okay, so now the second component of this type is another type declaration, B, and it has the same bounds. And I denote here with type intersection that the type of X has both type member A and type member B. Okay, and now the third component is more interesting because it's a type C, and the lower bound of C is X dot A, and the upper bound of C is X dot B. And essentially what this is saying is even though I have no idea what A and B are, <laughs> I still can say that they're the lower and upper bounds of some type, and this is what I mean by custom subtyping. Okay, so that's very nice, but Scala has a lot of features, and DOT models only a few of them. So we would really, be able, we would really like to be able to expand DOT with new features. The problem is that because the type safety proof is so complicated, as soon as we do this, everything breaks. And this is very sad because the whole purpose of a, of a core calculus is to be easily extensible with new features. So what makes the proof so hard? <laughs> well, so let's look at this type. So this is the, it's a recursive type and it's the type of objects in DOT. And suppose that we have a value 
V that under some typing context gamma is typed with this object type. So if I tell you that values in dot are either objects or functions, what is V? Well, you might think that it's an object, but in fact it's a, it's a function. And well, how is this possible? And it's possible because it all depends on the typing context in which we type V. So if we have a context with this type, which is a type declaration, and it's lower bounded with a function type and upper bounded with an object type, then I can have the following derivation. So first I take the, the, the exact type of X from the environment and type X with it, okay? So it's typed with this type declaration. Now because the lower bound in this type declaration is a function type, I know that the function type should be a subtype of X dot A. And similarly, the object type should be a supertype of X dot A, right? So then by transitivity, I have that the function type is a subtype of the object type. And because I can always type a function with a function type, right, this is an axiom. Now by subsumption, because my function type is a subtype of the object type, I have that the function can also be typed with the object type. Okay, so we started out thinking that our value should be an object, but it can also be a function. So at this point, types are completely meaningless because they don't tell us anything about values. And so in fact, this is, this, um, yeah, okay. So how did the existing uh, type safety proofs of DOT deal with this problem? So they observed that the typing context here has a type that is uninhabited. This means that there's no value that has this type, right? So we can rule out such contexts and only allow inhabited typing contexts. And that's a very important contribution because it allowed to prove dot type safe. But it's also a major source of complexity because it requires us to be thinking about contexts, variables, values, and types all at the same part time in a big part of the proof. And the contribution of our proof is that we separate reasoning about these concepts from each other. And we do this by defining a simple restriction on type that we call inert and providing a proof recipe that you can follow whenever you need to make sense of types. So how does this work? Let's look at our example again and see where our problem originated. So it originated here when we were trying to reason about bounds. And so more generally what we were doing is that we used a type rule that said that just because X has this declaration type, now automatically this lower bound T becomes a subtype of X dot A and the upper bound U becomes a supertype of X dot A. And without any further justification, right, we, we can now deduce that T is a subtype of U. And like this, we can introduce all sorts of nonsensical typing relationships. And this is bad because it completely collapses the subtyping lattice and brings us into this crazy world where everything is possible. Now, we could change this rule and make it into a well-behaved rule if we required our bounds to be the same, right? This wouldn't introduce any new subtyping relationships. And then dot would behave just like more familiar type systems <laughs> that, that we know out of tuple, but it would also lose all of its power. So what if we could show somehow that there is some condition under which the crazy rule implies the well-behaved rule? So one contribution of our paper is that it does this with inert types. So this condition is that every type in our typing context needs to be inert. And the type is inert if it's either a function type or a recursive type of an object with equal bounds. And everything else, all the other types are not inert. For example, this type, even though it's a recursive type, because it has different bounds, it's not an inert type. And inert types behave as if there were no custom subtyping relationship, even if the, in the presence of the crazy dot rule. The nice thing about inert types is that it's just a simple syntactic restriction on types. So you don't need to reason about the existence of values that, that somehow justify a type. Okay, so now we wanted to show that our crazy dot rule, if it comes with an inert context, implies a well-behaved rule. And I'm restricting the, the, the well-behaved rule even a little bit further by saying that the premise of the rule, so this is what I mean here. So I'm saying not just should X be typed with, a type, with this type declaration, 
but actually the most precise type of X that comes from the environment should be a recursive type and it should have this type declaration. So that's what it means. Okay, so what we do now is we take the dot typing rules, which are called the general rules, the general typing rules, and we swap the crazy rule with the well-behaved rule. And as a result, we get another typing judgment, which we call tight type, or which is called type type, tight typing. And we, um, it's denoted with a hash. So now tight typing is a, an existing typing judgment in the original type safety proof by NADA. But in, in their proof, it played a minor role, and it was used and proved in a different way. Whereas in our proof, it's really, it plays a central role. Okay, so now we want to prove that general typing, if it comes with an inert context, implies tight typing. And you can see that what we really need to show here is that the premise of, these, of the first rule implies the premise of the second rule. Because all the other rules are the same. We really only need to focus about on this rule. Okay, that's... But so how do we do this, given the crazy world of dot typing, where, where, type, where types don't have a, basically a meaning, right? Anything is possible. Well, remember that what we're really showing is that type, uh, general typing implies type typing. And if we do this by induction on the general typing derivation, then we get an induction hypothesis for free, right? We get for free that the same typing for x that we had for general typing should also be true for type typing. So this typing should also be true for type typing. And that's nice because now we can just focus on this part and prove it as a theorem while completely staying in the intuitive world of tight typing where there are no custom subtyping relationships. Okay, that's nice. So now we have another problem. And the problem is that it's really hard to do induction on this typing. And the reason is that Here's an example. So this typing could have been derived through the recursion elimination, and that could have been derived through the recursion introduction. And without really going to what this means, we see that there is a cycle here. So more generally, the derivation, this typing derivation of X could have been derived through all sorts of alternating introduction and elimination rules. And it's a known problem in logic that doing induction on derivations that admit cycles is problematic. So what we do is we stratify our rules into two stages. Okay, this first stage only consists of elimination rules. And that's called precise typing and it's denoted with a bang. So the second rule, the, sorry, the second stage takes the result of precise typing, applies a bunch of introduction rules, and that is called invertible typing. And it's denoted with a, with a double hash, okay? So the nice thing is now that Notice that both precise typing and invertible typing don't admit any cycles, so we can easily do induction on them. Okay, so what we do now is we take our tight typing that we started with, we apply, we uh, can easily show that it implies invertible typing, then we convert this to a precise type, and because we have an inert context, we will easily get that the, the type bounds must be the same, and from there we know what the actual type of X was in the environment. So like this we proved our tight bounds theorem, and since that theorem was reasoning about these two premises of our, uh, of our crazy and well-behaved rules, we showed that these, the first rule implies the second, and like this we show that, tight, that in fact, yes, general typing implies tight typing within an inert context, so we can get from this crazy world where everything is possible to our paradox-free world of tight typing without custom subtyping relationships. And we follow this sequence of steps a lot of times in the proof, where we start out with just a general type, and then we convert it to a really precise type. And we, so that's why we call it a proof recipe, because we prescribe it whenever you need to make, make sense of type. For example, and most importantly, it's useful in the canonical forms lemmas, where you start out with a general type of X, and you need to know, well, what is the value of X? So what you do is you apply the proof recipe to get the, uh, the type of X that it has in the environment. Since that is a type of X, the value of X also has this type. So you apply the proof recipe again until you get a precise type for the value, which you can easily invert and get what the value is. In this case, it's an object. 
This is a dependency diagram of our lemmas, and it shows that the canonical forms lemmas depend on the proof recipe lemmas. And the proof recipe lemmas have the general to types theorem, which eliminates custom subtyping relationship, and it has the invertible and precise typing lemmas, which give us precise type information and let us easily do induction. Here's an example of an extension of our proof with another, so of dot with another feature. In this case, we added mutation. Um, and you see that it's a really straightforward uh, addition, extension to the proof. I also want to show you a dependency graph of the actual COG files. And what I want to point out here is that our technique is completely orthogonal to the operational semantics that you use. So whether you prefer big steps or small step semantics, you can use the same ideas, as long as you have a call by value semantics. So if you want to reason about typing in dot, make sure you have an inert context and follow the proof recipe so that you can escape the crazy world of dot typing where everything is possible to get down to an intuitive world where you can trust the types. Also, check out our proof, our cock proof under this address, read our paper, and come talk to us because we're all here at Uppsala this week. Thanks. Right. requirements in practice for right. reward Scala programs? It's a very good question. And so it's not restrictive. It's not in any way restricting the expressiveness of the dot calculus. And so all you need to do is make sure that you have a call by value semantics. And I want to show you how why this is the case. So what you really need to make to ensure is that every subtype, every subterm of a term can be um, can be typed in an inert context. So if you have this prime that is typed, that is inside of an evaluation context, then if you, you need to make sure that you have a typing environment that corresponds to this evaluation context that is inert and that you can type your T prime in this environment. And so why this works in DOT is that it has an administrative normal form, semantics, and call by value semantics. So what this means is that your evaluation context will always consist of a sequence of let bindings of variables to values. And you can always find a typing correspond, uh, an inert typing context that corresponds to this because the types of values always can be inert. So that's why it's not restrictive. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, hi, uh, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering about the down. Okay. And it seems like the problem you're running into is that you sort of you're allowing like crossing representations because you're subtyping an object and then turning it into a function for okay. the other yeah. way around. Right. What if you restricted your right. subtype so that they're always between similar kinds of things? So right. object types can only subtype object types. Right, so I want to show you why you can't do this. So, um, it's a, it, it completely makes sense, you're right. Um, so you, it will really limit the expressiveness of your calculus because you will have, uh, you, you will basically rule out the following. So let's say you want to have, um, you want to find out if this is a good type, right? So you want to know if S is a subtype of U, right? Like that's what you want to show, that's what you suggested. Well, not necessarily, I'm not saying that it has to be a subtype, of the same kind. What does that and mean? S, both S is either, S and U are both record, I mean uh, object types, or they're both functions. That's too restrictive. That's too restrictive. So basically, you want to, in some way, you want to know if S is a subtype of U or in any way related to U, right? And you will need to check this in this extended typing context. But you already assume in this typing context that S is a subtype of U. So you won't be able to, so this will always be true, basically. And if you um, don't allow this, then you can't have, for example, this uh, type, where you say that C is something between X A and X B. I had it on a previous slide. And you, can't, you won't even be able to do aliasing. So it, this will be too restrictive, unfortunately. Yeah. 
Okay, sure, yeah. Any other questions?